I'm Barry Mitchell. Welcome to my socially distanced terrace and another edition of Simply Science. So, you've seen everything there is to see on Netflix twice. Good. Spend some time with us. We have some real interesting stories today. Like this one. Has your doctor ever shown you an MRI or x-ray and you have no idea what you're looking at? Well, new technology makes 3D imaging possible. And it's so simple, even a child can understand it. And as Groucho Marx would say, run out and find me a child. I can't make head nor tail of it. Here's Andrew Falzone. These are traditional brain scans. Unless you're a medical doctor trained to read these images like a radiologist, you probably don't see what's hidden inside. But with 3D technology, even an untrained eye can spot a sizable brain tumor colored here in orange. This fairly new way to see the body in three dimensions is from a company called Surgical Theater. Alone, Gary is its chief technology officer. We take regular scans, like you said, MRI, uh, CTs, and all the flavors of those types of scans. And we superimpose them together, if you will. We uh, fuse them together. It allows us to build or reconstruct them into a three-dimensional model. And because it's your scan, it represents your pathology very accurately. Surgical Theater was co-founded by Gary and now CEO Moti Avasar. The two met in the Israeli Air Force and transitioned from piloting to helping design flight simulator software in conjunction with Lockheed Martin in Cleveland, Ohio. And you can't, you know, live in the Cleveland area and not bump into neurosurgeons in the coffee shop. And, and, you know, you, you can hear my heavy accent and, and people listen and we discuss our business very loudly, mm -hmm. uh, as Israelis do. And uh, one neurosurgeon in particular, Dr. Warren Selman, kind of uh, listened. A very nice dude, but we learned later that this guy is very high, very senior neurosurgeon. He is the neurosurgeon uh, chief, chief of neurosurgery department at the UH in Cleveland. And he was wondering if we can build something like we do for the you know, F-16 pilots for neurosurgeons. The software created by Surgical Theater allows surgeons to plan surgeries and even rehearse them long before they enter the operating room. So we do use it for some more complex procedures and we have one of their units in our operating room so that we can actually refer to these VR images if we need to um, during a case to look at some particularly challenging anatomy. Dr. Keith Mortman is the chief of thoracic surgery at George Washington University Hospital in Washington, D.C. He says the platform goes beyond rehearsing and performing surgery. What I've found that the greater use for it to be is actually in my outpatient clinic for patient education. So throughout my career, I would draw patients pictures of, of their lung. We have a little tear off lung pad, for instance, and I still do that. But when I'm done doing that, we actually bring in our mobile unit into the exam room and the patient or their loved one can actually put on the VR headset and they actually become the avatar walking through their own chest and actually looking at their own lung tumor. So with the goggles on, you know, as, as they look up, they can look towards the top part of the chest. And if they look right, they can see their lung cancer. If they look right, they're looking at their heart and their diaphragm. So um, it, it's been a very powerful tool for us to use for patient education, because now we're seeing, and we've started to do some studies looking at this actually, that our patients are walking away with a much better understanding, not only of their anatomy, but really of, of their planned surgical procedure that, that, that'll be coming up. And I'm guessing uh, for a lot of patients who are going through a difficult uh, procedure, that it kind of reduces their anxiety level. I, I think the more a patient understands, uh, the more education we can give them, and, and this is an, another tool, a very powerful tool that we have to do that, I do think that the more comfortable they're going to be um, with the with, uh, proposed surgery. Dr. Mortman recently used the software to create 3D images of a patient infected with COVID-19. Once you look at that 360-degree view, um, there's a very stark contrast between the 
COVID infected lung tissue and then the adjacent normal lung tissue. It starts by taking a, a 360 degree spin around this patient's lungs. And essentially everything that you're seeing in yellow is virus infected lung tissue along with some, some inflammation. And everything that you're seeing in blue is more normal lung tissue. And something tells me the surgical theater software will really help with the diagnosis and explanation uh, to those patients um, as they continue to progress after their symptoms resolve. And that's one of the things we're actually gonna be looking at now that we have um, additional COVID positive patients and additional CAT scans. We're starting to render those into the 360 VR system as well. Um, and we have some um, artificial intelligence software at our disposal to, to see if that'll better help us quantify the amount of lung damage and, and actually study these patients going forward. Giving us a whole new view of a relatively new disease and helping patients better understand their prognosis, a feeling that is quite rewarding for a lone Gary. For me, I've been flying machines of war for many years. That's my uh, you know, military career. Although those machines were used many times to save lives, you know, as a helicopter pilot, I am very emotional about seeing my system, the thing that I developed. And still this very experienced surgeon looked at me and said, Gary, this is making a difference. And it almost brought me to tears, you know, to, to get this sense of feeling that I invented something that can help him save lives. For Simply Science, I'm Andrew Falzone. When much of the world went into lockdown to prevent the spread of COVID-19, good news has been in short supply. But fewer cars on the road and less industry means less pollution and blue skies. Here's Donna Hanover. During stay-home orders designed to fight the coronavirus pandemic, something visually remarkable happened. In many places around the world, air pollution dropped dramatically. In cities in northern India, for example. Citizens have been reporting that uh, they can see the Himalayas for the first time in their lives. Professor Dan Westervelt of the Columbia University Lamont Doherty Earth Observatory says usually vehicle traffic, combustion engines, and power plants release into the air several components of pollution that are harmful to our breathing. The main culprits are things like PM2.5, uh, which is particulate matter less than 2.5 microns in size, and then also gases such as ozone and nitrogen dioxide. There's been a huge decrease in the amount of vehicle miles traveled by people as they've not been going to work as much. There's been an overall decrease in energy demand, uh, electricity demand in particular has been down quite a bit. Um, and so all of these things have added up to lead to um, uh, a pretty significant decrease in air pollution levels in almost everywhere in the world. It's clear that China, Italy, and many other countries had a big decline in air pollution. You could see it in U.S. cities like San Francisco and Los Angeles. NASA satellites show what's happened. Around the clock, even during pandemics, these satellites are still in orbit. What they're actually doing is a laser beam or some kind of uh, emission of light or radiation can come down from the satellite, from its instrument, you can measure how much of that back is sort of reflected towards the satellite um, back to its, you know, um, instruments. So from that kind of information, you can get how much of air pollution is in the air. And NASA keeps an air quality website for folks to check. New York City has some air pollution improvement as well, according to City University of New York professor Andrew Reinman. On top of our building at the Advanced Science Research Center, we have an observatory with a whole suite of different environmental sensors. Uh, and colleagues and, and myself, we are measuring, uh, we have instrumentation there that's measuring things like carbon dioxide, carbon monoxide, and uh, particulate matter pollution. And we've been doing this for several months now, so we've been able to track changes in uh, different aspects of atmospheric chemistry as a result of uh, these changes in human behavior driven by the COVID-19 pandemic. 
Traffic volume in New York City has declined by nearly 45%. As a result, not only are the number of cars on the road down, but the cars that are left on the road are moving at a faster rate, less stop and, and go traffic, which also means that for every mile a car is driving, it's releasing fewer pollutants into, into the atmosphere. And this is really important because uh, humans, especially uh, individuals with uh, respiratory elements like asthma, would be particularly sensitive to that particular matter of pollution because it also uh, sort of gets at our upper respiratory systems. Are scientists worried about a surge in air pollution when people come out from their homes? I think scientists are quite a bit concerned about regulations being uh, relaxed in order to sort of, uh, you know, make up for lost production. Things like that, you know, could add up to some kind of uh, negative effect. And I think some scientists are indeed worried about that. Also, while they welcome the brief drop in air pollution, many scientists say it won't do much to curb climate change and global warming. That's caused largely by carbon dioxide, which lasts for hundreds of years in the atmosphere and which has only gone down slightly as we've continued to heat many of our homes with oil. It's not going to affect the warming very significantly because there's already so much uh, CO2 in the pipeline already since it lasts 100 years in the atmosphere. So I don't expect there to be much of a, a change in the direction of, of global warming when it comes to uh, the, the stay-at-home orders. What we hope will happen is that it, it really highlights sort of the magnitude of the capacity of human behavior or shifts in human behavior to alter the chemistry of the atmosphere, to alter our environment. Maybe it, it's that added little push that we need to think about starting to move towards alternative fuel sources and maybe electrifying more of our, our energy production using renewable sources. And maybe the bar gets a lot higher for travel across the world all the time for you know international conferences or maybe companies allow their employees to work from home a couple times a week or once a week or something like that maybe it's a it's a good reminder that we have it in our power to change the course of things a little bit for the better i'm donna hanover for simply science Educational video games have always reminded me of Classics Illustrated Comics. Remember those? They looked like comic books, but they were boring. Well, a professor at Hunter College is making fun video games that teach kids STEM, science, technology, engineering, and math. And they're fun, and boy do we need them now in this age of distance learning. Here's Susan Jun. They may not be popular with parents, but there's no denying that video games provide a welcome distraction to kids during social distancing. And while entertaining, most are far from educational. A gap the company Killer Snails closes with its gaming for good model that offers a mix of digital, virtual reality, and tabletop games, which focus on science. When I was forming the company, I wanted to make sure that we use a content that kids already like, right? So they already like to play games, like give them games that have STEM in them. I spoke with Killer Snails co-founder Mandy Holford, an associate professor of chemistry at Hunter College and CUNY Graduate Center. 
the kids are home, they're all online, they're playing things like Fortnite. And the real question is, as parents, how can we get them to engage with educational material that's fun? Usually when people come to games, they come excited, they come ready to learn, they come sort of, you know, stress-free. A mindset these game makers tap into to get kids excited about science. Created in 2015 with initial funding from the National Science Foundation, Killer Snails is now used in classrooms across the country. <laughs> The name Killer Snails comes from Holford's research on venomous marine snails that produce peptides used in painkillers. The snails play a prominent part in the company's newest virtual reality game called Biodive. Students are scientists researching the habitat of venomous marine snails. The, the mission of that game is to try to save the habitat of the killer snails. So you want to learn about biotic and abiotic pressures that are, that are ruining coral reefs. In Scuba Adventures, another Killer Snails VR creation, players are virtual marine biologists racing to tag creatures before their oxygen tanks run out. Not all the games involve screens, some are just good old card games. Kids are, you know, learning about all the organisms um, that we have in the forest, in the ocean, and it's basically a food web where you learn who is a predator and who's a prey. In addition to learning scientific facts, Holford says the gameplay of winning and losing teaches kids to think objectively when problem solving, which is a key part of STEM learning. Each failure should be a learning process. So you have to think critically and analytically about why did I fail? What happened here and what can I fix and how do I make it better the next time? To help support students, educators, and parents, Killer Snails is offering a selection of games for free during the pandemic. We wanted to make science accessible during this time, given the importance of what was happening in the news and what's happening in reality with this pandemic and, and the fact that science is going to be the savior for, for how society comes through this. For free killer science games, go to killersnails.com. For Simply Science, I'm Susan Jun. And speaking of video games, one of the most popular of recent years was Angry Birds. You want Angry Birds? Watch this. They are among the tiniest and most colorful birds in the world. Well, all right, those two, but today we're talking hummingbirds. The motion of the wings create these humming notes. They sound more like insects, so that's why they're called hummingbirds. Dr. Alejandro Rico Guevara is the assistant professor of biology and curator of birds at the Burke Museum of the University of Washington in Seattle. I think many things are fascinating about hummingbirds. I grew up in Colombia. When I went to the Amazon for the first time, there was one particular hummingbird that approached us. The hummingbird just hovered in front of our faces. Well, that caught my attention and my scientific interest, uh, like why these tiny animals that seem so fragile can be that bold and now, as we understand, so aggressive. I think they have a Napoleon complex. They're so small, that's why they're vicious. They have this inner uh, giant that <laughs> just needs to come out, and the way it comes out is fighting. Do hummingbirds use their beaks to fight because of food? or a mate? They fight for both. They are territorial to try to fence off other competitors. They are sitting on a branch and they see other hummingbirds around and they get all bent out of shape and they have to fight. They, they, they're not social animals. And they fight dirty using the saw-like serrations in their beaks. The serrations now, we believe, are used to actually grab each other and pluck feathers off. So in their fights, in these like chases, high-speed chases, and if they pluck a tail feather, that's very damaging. Their beaks have many uses. This one is handy for checking the oil in your car. No! They use that needle-like beaks to get inside flowers. Nectarivores are animals that feed on nectar and mostly get the highest percentage of the calories in their diet from floral nectar. 
It's like surviving on soda, all pumped up. They're burning all that nectar very quickly. But flowers get something out of the deal too. It's called mutualism. Humbirds pollinate many different species of plants. Uh, what that means is that different flowers have adapted, have evolved to be pollinated by hummingbirds through this match of the bill and the corolla. And without hummingbirds, many of those species of plants would go extinct. In places, for instance, high up in the mountains, they are way better pollinators than insects. You're very much into citizen science. Yes, citizen science is so important for us and for conservation. We have a project called Hummingbird and Flowers in a platform that is called iNaturalist. Nature lovers anywhere in the world upload their photos to iNaturalist.org. This helps scientists collect data on the kinds of flowers hummingbirds are feeding on in the wild. And we are linking all of those photographs that people have been acquiring for years and years to match the pollination networks on a very large scale. Now the most important question, why do hummingbirds hum? because uh, they don't know the words. <laughs> <laughs> there you go. You heard it from a scientist, Dr. Alejandro Rico Guevara. Thank you so much for talking with us. Okay, thank you so much, Barry. My pleasure. You ever read a cereal box that says contains no GMOs? What are GMOs? Are they franken food? Are they safe to eat? Will they end world hunger? Does that mean soon we'll be raising chickens with six drumsticks? Here's Ari Goldberg with the story from Lehman College. Tell me if you've seen this before. An ad or story about GMOs where they use images like this. That's some eye-grabbing stuff, to be sure. But here's the thing. That's not what GMOs are. Scientists don't take tomatoes into their lab and inject them with a syringe. That's just an image cooked up in a marketing department to put something cool looking on TV or in a newspaper. So, okay, for all the noise and misinformation like that out there, what exactly are GMOs? When nature, and, and I should say breeding, is based on natural evolution, natural evolution is very, very slow. So whereas nature might take 350,000 years to create an enzyme that performs a certain task, we can do this in the laboratory in 18 months. Professor Eleanor Wurzel is a scientist at Lehman College and she gave us a crash course in genetics. You see, there are only a few ways genes can change. One is evolution. Somewhat faster is selective breeding, say, a farmer cross-pollinating two bigger tomatoes so that the offspring has a greater chance of being big too. And of course, recently, genetically modifying organisms directly, GMOs. The DNA provides the instructions for the plant to make its components, its chemicals. So the instructions are not so important. It's the product that's important. Indeed, that's all genes really are, instructions to tell a plant what to do. To take a step back and dust off our high school biology class notes a bit here, all DNA molecules are made up of the same four building blocks, adenine, thymine, cytosine, and guanine, ATCG. The genes that make a rattlesnake venomous or a tomato juicy or Michael Jordan good at basketball, all of them are made up of the same A, T, C, and G, just in very different combinations. The point being, no matter what food we eat, the most genetically modified GMO or the most naturally organic grown, the genetic material we're eating is the same A, T, C, and G, no matter where we got it from. The food itself is just as real, no matter what the instructions it had. It's just a question of what those instructions are. Imagine a farmer has a tomato plant, beautiful fruit, but it does not grow in poor soils. It has another plant that has horrible fruit, but grows in poor soils. Now, the molecular biologist figured out the gene that is necessary for making the beautiful fruit and knows it's a single gene if they put this into the plant that makes the, um, you know, the horrible fruit but can grow in, in, in poor soils, they have the perfect combination. A single gene 
They can go in the laboratory, they know exactly which gene has been introduced. Very simple, that's a GMO product. Now, if a farmer wants to get the same tomato by using traditional crossbreeding, they too are trying to get just that gene changed. In a sense, that already is genetically modifying. However, when you crossbreed, you may get the gene you want, sure, but you're also getting all the other genes from the rest of the plant along with it. So it's not only going to take a lot of generations of breeding to get the tomato you want, but you may also be getting a lot of genes you don't want. We call it genetic drag. The breeder was selecting by his uh, visual assessment of the plants, but doesn't know what else is coming along for the ride. Toxins, allergens, who knows? That's traditional breeding. So I would say that with GMO, we have an opportunity to make our plants good for us. So we don't have to worry about allergens or toxins in the plant. We know exactly what gene has been introduced. Now that's not at all to dismiss traditional farming or breeding. To the contrary, the point is, they have all proven useful to our agriculture, and just as importantly, proven safe. No matter where the genes come from in a food, the genes are all made from the same A, T, C, and G, after all. Now, to be sure, there are plenty of valid criticisms of the agriculture industry. But as with any science, it's the application that is the key. So when it comes to cutting through the marketing noise around GMOs, Professor Wurzel says, at the end of the day, it's all about better communication between scientists and informed consumers. And if they don't feel they're part of the process, then they will be very suspect of something like GMO. And hopefully that won't happen in the future. Breaking down the information and misinformation about GMOs. I'm Ari Goldberg for Simply Science. And that's our show. You can always find us at tv.cuny.edu and Facebook and YouTube. I'm Barry Mitchell. See you next time on Simply Science. Ba ba da dum dum dum, dum ba da dum dum dum.